I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ring, but if you weren't, I bet that made you feel really good that we were going to do 15 hours in an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> Wagner was extraordinary in many ways. He changed the face of theater, he changed the face of opera, he changed the face of music. Obviously, he felt comfortable writing operas in a much more expanded time scale than any composer or dramatist before him had ever imagined. The time scale for the actual composition of the ring is also extraordinary. This piece from conception to completion was 26 years in the making. So while Wagner was doing other things on the side, like writing Tristan and Isolde or Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg, he wrote uh, the ring starting with the final scene in text only in 1848 and completing the final bar in 1874. So as you can see, this was a, a lifetime project. And I think what's truly extraordinary is that in addition to being full of superb music, it raises just about every issue that, that human beings confront. Uh, there, is, there is virtually nothing that remains untouched by the ring of the Nibelung. Every composer, when they write an opera, has the opportunity to put human themes that are important to them into that opera. So for example, Mozart's operas tend to focus on, if I am in love with somebody, will that somebody remain faithful? That is a key theme for Mozart, and it comes out in all of his mature, I, when he wasn't 12, all of his mature operas. So for Verdi, there were two themes, I suppose we could say. One was uh, having a country for Italians, and the other was having um, operas about jealousy, and sometimes those blended into the same opera. But uh, he, too, had his pet themes. Puccini tended to write about women who loved so much that they would sacrifice their lives. Well, Wagner's theme is redemption. Redemption for the human race, redemption for men, uh, often through the agency of a woman. But in this opera, uh, in addition to the redemption theme, Wagner examines just about everything he can about human nature and society. He lived at a time when philosophers in the German-speaking world were re-examining what God meant. And the opening of the whole ring is a depiction of the creation of the world, the creation of the universe through the river Rhine. Now, forgive me when I just say something a little technical. By this time period, great German composers naturally associated high spiritual concepts with the key of E flat major. And <laughs> there's a reason for that. But uh, it begins with the magic flute, it's Mozart's magic flute, and it continues through Beethoven's Fidelio, and then Weber's Der uh, Freischütz. And sure enough, when Wagner wants to show the beginning spiritual principle that precedes actual existence, he uses that key. So he not only uses that key, but he uses it so slowly that it's almost in real time for the creation of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> but since I'm doing this in an hour and 15 minutes, I'm going to compress everything. You may have noticed that we're still in E flat major. <laughs> the ingredients that go into the universe, into life, into creation, in Wagner's mind, are chordal. They're not only tonal, but they remain on the same chord, and, and they're undisturbed. Wagner sets up a duality in the whole ring cycle between chordal things, which are based on the primitive elements of the world, the unchanging, un disturbed by humans, and elements that are scales that represent human intervention and human change in the world. Not always negative, 
but he certainly makes that dichotomy very clear. The Rhine Gold begins with three Rhine maidens, and the Rhine maidens protect the treasure of the Rhine, which is a magic hoard of gold. Enter, to disturb the play of these three idyllic maidens, Alberich. Alberich is a Nibelung. He is from an underground race of dwarves, and the title of the whole ring cycle is Der Ring des Nibelung. And the Nibelung they're referring to in the title is Alberich. So he is really the title character of the entire ring cycle. The ring at the beginning of the ring cycle doesn't exist. Alberich comes and is trying to seduce one of the Rhine maidens, any one, it doesn't matter which one, but he's chasing them all around and because they're in their native element of water in the Rhine, of course he can't catch them. But one of them says rather carelessly, of course there is a mythic magical prophecy that says if someone were willing to renounce human love and not chase Rhine maidens around or anybody else, they could own and inherit all the wealth that is in the Rhine. Now, whoever created this ancient myth clearly felt very confident that no human being would be capable of complete renunciation of love. They didn't count on this Nibelung named Alberich, because Alberich stands up, renounces love, the Rhine maidens go shrieking away in terror, and he now possesses the entire treasure of the Rhine. The orchestra tells us this immediately because all of this beautiful serenity of E flat major is completely disturbed and we leave any key center that would give us any feeling of harmony or peace. And indeed the world, now that Alberich has done this, has been thrown into disharmony. Peace is over because once a human being can have a value other than just connecting to their fellow human beings with love, what will the world become? It's a good question now, it was a good question then. Wagner takes us up to the realm of the gods at this point. Now the gods are, in Wagner's epic, the gods of Norse mythology, renamed by their German names. So Odin becomes Wotan, uh, Freya is his wife, and, uh, excuse me, Fricka, his wife is Fricka, and Fricka has a sister named Freya. Freya takes care of all the golden apples that enable the gods to be immortal. There's also Loge, whom you know, the god of fire. Uh, Thor becomes Donner, the god of thunder, and his brother Fro. So all the happy gods are living in their celestial bliss, and the new real estate is that uh, Fricka has persuaded Wotan to build them all a grand palace that he's going to call Valhalla. So Valhalla isn't just a palace for the gods, it's also the place where all of the fallen soldiers who die nobly in battle will be taken, not just any old way, but on the back of a flying horse with a Valkyrie as their guide. Now, what are Valkyries? Wotan is undoubtedly the most promiscuous character. I can't say person because he's divine, but uh, he's the most promiscuous character in all of literature. And he has thousands of children by thousands of different women scattered all over the universe. But he has nine very special children because Erda, the goddess of the earth, whose other name is Vala, has nine daughters with him. She, she has non uplets And uh, these girls grow into the most extraordinary warriors uh, in the world. They fly on, on these magical flying horses and they collect the dead at the end of every battle who have fought bravely enough to deserve to go to Valhalla. So how did Wotan build Valhalla? Now this is where the divine and the human mix. Apparently, he can't just wave his fingers and say, I want a huge palace. Plus, there wouldn't be much of a story. So 
he, in fact, engages two giants, Fazolt and Fafner. And Fazolt and Fafner agree to build this magnificent castle for him. But they don't agree to do it with no price. Wotan rather rashly tells them that he will let them take Fricka's sister, Freya, remember the one who tends the golden apples, and that Freya can live with them, and that then they too can be immortal. Now, while we don't see a lot of giants, at the time of this epic, giants were the main race inhabiting the surface of the earth. The uh, underground is inhabited by the Nibelungs and the heavens by the gods, Wotan and company, but the giants are the, the uh, main creature who lives on the earth. So these giants naturally feel that Wotan has made a promise and that he'll keep his promise. All right, let's go back to the music for a second. You know, excuse me, you know that Wagner, in order to create his vast operas, used a compositional technique which, although it wasn't completely new, he certainly took to a far greater level than any composer before him, and that is the light motif, the leading motive. The musical theme, which whether it's two notes or 20 notes, tells us what character, what feeling, what idea or concept we're dealing with so that when different characters come together in a scene, he can tell us through this musical language uh, what else is being referred to. So the theme for the River Rhine, you heard. And for the Rhine Maidens. Notice it's also really just one chord. The theme for Valhalla is almost in one chord. Again, a very stately theme in D flat major. looking at the space that will soon be theirs for Valhalla. Whenever they sing about it, uh, they're immediately accompanied by the orchestra with that music. So that's the essence of the leitmotif technique. Now, there is one member of this godly society who isn't fully divine. He's only half god and he's half human, and that is Loga, the god of fire. This gives him both advantages and disadvantages, and the advantages are that he's much more clever than the gods because he's had to live by his wits uh, for much of eternity. Locus music, by the way, is not centered around a, a single chord. Uh, because he is half human, we always hear him moving chromatically. <laughs> chromatic figures depict Loga. All right, so. I have to move forward here. Fricka begins to suspect that the bargain Wotan made with the giants isn't going to turn out so well because either he has to go back on his word, or they have to give up Freya, which means giving up the golden apples. The giants come in, and here is the leitmotif of the brother giants, Fazolt and Fafna. One thing that I cannot do for you today is the incredible color of a full Wagner orchestra on this lovely piano. Wagner, as I said, made many changes, including creating, inventing, 
new instruments for the orchestra, which we call wagner tubas in sound. they are somewhere between a french horn and a trombone but he wanted something that had more gravitas than a french horn and yet was more mellow and beautiful in its timbre than a trombone so the orchestra for the entire ring has four additional wagner tubas and about sixteen other brass instruments uh, it's it's quite gigantic it includes if you really do it the way wagner asks us to six harps and uh, dozens and dozens of strings in every department quadruple winds lots of percussion i get away from myself all right so we're back to those giants and those giants quite reasonably are saying please pay what you promised you would pay and the uh, response that Wotan gives is once Loge gets here, we'll work it out. Well, the giants aren't really willing to, to accept those terms. And uh, there's Donner, the sort of one who has no, no uh, anger management skills, threatening to, <laughs> to uh, you know, just destroy the giants and crush them right now. And they say, we don't want to fight. We just want our payment. So at the last moment, Loge shows up. And he says, there's some important news on another part of the world, and that is that Alberich has just stolen their gold from the Rhine. And he says, provocatively, so the giants can overhear him, anybody who possesses that gold would be able to have dominion over the entire world. And at that point, the giants aren't so interested in Freya. They say, well, is there a way that you could get that gold, Wotan, you all-powerful god, you? and give it to us. And uh, Wotan says, how can I give you what I don't have? But Loga says, I'm sure that something can be arranged. And uh, the, the giants take Freya away as ransom. And they say, well, when you get the gold, uh, we'll give you Freya back. So now Wotan and Loga take a long journey from Valhalla all the way down into the underground where they find Alberich. Alberich, who took the gold from the Rhine Maidens by renouncing love forever, has all of the other Nibelung dwarfs in his slavery, and they are working day and night, including Alberich's own brother, Mima. Now, Mima is also an extraordinary smith and goldsmith. So Mima has created two incredible treasures from this gold. One is called the Tarnhelm. It's a little light uh, helmet that you can wear. And the Tarnhelm enables you to assume any form at all, including complete invisibility. But even more extraordinarily, he has made a ring. And this ring would enable the possessor to have complete power over everything. This is the hinge of the story. Alberich is a very proud dwarf. And when Wotan and Loge appear, he stops his work, having all of the other dwarves uh, doing their smithing, which we hear as they beat their hammers on anvil. So, Loga says, I understand that you have this power, but surely you, a mere dwarf, can't figure out how to wield it. Well, the mere dwarf turns himself into a dragon and shows Loga that in fact, even a dwarf can handle power Loga says, yes, that's impressive, but it would be far more difficult, I'm sure, to turn yourself into something very tiny, like the smallest toad. <laughs> so Alberich turns himself into a tiny toad, and immediately Loga puts his foot on top of him and takes the Tarnhelm off of his head. So Alberich, stripped of the magic gold, is just a normal dwarf, and they take him captive and carry him up to Valhalla. Now this may seem to you like an act of thievery. It is. 
and whether Wagner was talking about uh, the industrial world or colonization or anything, we'll never know. But he created a drama into which we can read just about anything that we like. Back up in Valhalla, Wotan has ordered all of the gold to be brought and given to the giants, Fasold and Fafna. They put up two stakes and they put Freya in between them, and as the gold is loaded up, they say, once we can't see her anymore, then we're paid. Well, it takes every last speck of gold to build the tower up as high as Freya. And still, Fasolt says, I can see a little bit of hair glinting through that pile. So they're forced to give Fasolt and Fafner the Tarn Helm as well. And Loga says, are you satisfied now? You've taken everything. But Fafner says, I think there's one tiny speck of light, and I can see the glimmer from, Freya, from Freya's eye. And he makes Wotan give up the golden ring that he's already appropriated uh, and give the ring to the pile of gold. So now the ring is the property of Fazolt and Fafna. Well, Albrecht curses the ring and curses everybody who comes in contact with it, in addition to causing the strife that it already has. Within moments of owning the ring, Fazolt murders his brother, uh, excuse me, Fafner murders his brother Fazolt and uh, shows right away the danger of possessing this ring, that whoever has this absolute power is cursed to misuse it. The giants go away and the gods are happy. They have their home, they have their Valhalla, and as the opera, Das Rheingold, the gold of the Rhine, comes to an end, they cross a beautiful rainbow bridge into Valhalla. second opera, Die Valkyre, takes us to a different place on Earth and characters whom we haven't met yet, but they will all be woven together soon enough. So the main realm of the Earth, as I said, uh, is largely inhabited by giants, but thanks to Wotan, there are some other races, and a new race the Velzung have appeared. One young Velzung man has been orphaned, separated from his father. His mother died conceiving him, uh, not conceiving him, giving birth to him. And he is named Siegmund. When the opera Die Valkyra opens, Siegmund is running through a storm looking for shelter. <laughs> start to hear other light He sees a cottage and decides that this is the only place where he's going to find a roof. So he goes in 
and uh, falls asleep from exhaustion in front of the fireplace. And this being opera, moments later, a beautiful young woman walks into the room, spots him, and says, a stranger, I must take care of him. <laughs> so she gets him some mead and takes care of him and looks into his face, and pretty soon we start to hear music. <laughs> young woman is falling in love with this young stranger. Unfortunately, the woman is married and her husband took her as a young girl by force and regards her as his property. His name is Hunding. Now, if you speak German, you already get that it's better to be named Siegmund than Hunding. <laughs> Sieg means victory and Hund means dog. So, Wagner immediately tells us that the man who is keeping Sieglinde, the beautiful woman, captive, is little better than an animal. And uh, we see this in his behavior. He's very rude to Sigmund. He finds out that the family to which Sigmund belongs are, in fact, enemies to his kinsmen. And he says, by the laws of hospitality, you may spend one night here, but in the morning, I am going to kill you. So Siegmund takes him up on this offer. Sieglinde and uh, Hunding go off to bed, and Siegmund, looking around the room, <laughs> this is opera, right, sees a tree stump with a sword sticking out of it. See? that this sword must have deep spiritual powers because it's not depicted musically with scalar passages, but with uh, appoggiaturas. It's one big D major chord. So that tells us, in Wagner's language, that this sword is somehow connected to the gods. However, Sigmund doesn't think anymore about that sword. He instead is surprised to see the young woman coming back into the room. And she says, I gave my husband a potion so that he would sleep for a long time. And it's just you and me right now. So he gets pretty excited, and he sings to her that she is like spring. That, uh, in fact, while spring gives life to everything on earth, and the buds blossom and the birds sing, that she has just given new life for the first time to him. is called Wintersturm. Wintersturm of Wickenden Wonnemond. Now, Wagner didn't try to write, po you, Wagner wrote all the words to his own operas, all of them. But he didn't make rhymes in the sense of uh, day and hay and may. Instead, he had the initial consonants of words be the same, so that this alliterative rhyme, stop rhyme, which went back to the Middle Ages, echoed the time period when these epic myths and legends were created. So, Wintersturm, a vision dem Wonnemont, right? This is all throughout the ring. Um, and if you, if you are listening to the ring and you hear Leis lapte sie den Leisen, it's a continuous feature. So now, Sieglinde uh, responds to Siegmund, and she, she sings to him that he has taken the cold winter of her life and thawed it as, in the same way that he has thawed her heart.
sing rapturous love duets, and ultimately, as the curtain falls very quickly, they fall to the floor making love. Arthur Schopenhauer, who was a big fan of Wagner's, said in the first copy that he received, which Wagner asked him to comment on, where it said, the curtain falls very quickly. Schopenhauer wrote, not quickly enough. <laughs> so in act two of Die Valkyrie, uh, suddenly we're in a whole different place. Siegmund, had, well, I didn't finish the story. Um, Siegmund, of course, sees that, that sword, and uh, Sieglinde explains to him that um, one night a stranger came and put it there, and uh, since the stranger's name is accompanied by this music, we quickly figure out that the stranger was Wotan himself. So Wotan has left a sword for Siegmund to find. Now, this is a spoiler, I have to tell you this, I won't wait for the movie. Siegmund and Sieglinde turn out to be brother and sister, and their father is none other than Wotan. So, in fact, Wotan has conceived a very long-range plan over several generations to win back the ring. Wotan himself is not allowed to wrest from the giants what is theirs. But, he reasons, if he can create a being who is separate from the gods and completely without fear, why then, perhaps this being can take the ring with impunity and return it, Wotan thinks, to Wotan himself. So, Sieglinde indicates to Siegmund that this sword is there for the taking. Of course, hundreds of people have tried to remove it and failed, but it won't surprise you to know that Siegmund is immediately successful and now has in his possession this great and mighty sword uh, named Notum, which means in need. When you are in need, this sword is always there. <laughs> So, into battle goes Siegmund in Act Two with Notung at his side to kill, he hopes, Hunding. However, there is a complication. I mentioned that a Wotan is beyond just your garden variety philanderer. He, he's been everywhere, and uh, you know, he's immortal. He's had a lot of time to do this. So, Fricka, his wife, has had a lot of time to get very resentful about this. And Fricka steps in and says, you must not allow Siegmund the Velzung to live, because that would say to the world at large that not only is this uh, relationship sanctioned, but they're brother and sister. You must absolutely have Siegmund killed by Hundi. Wotan fights this, but he realizes, as Fricka unfolds her case, that he is absolutely bound by the pact that he has with the universe to observe certain rules, and this is one of them that cannot be changed. So he promises Fricka that he will allow Hunding to kill um, Siegmund in battle. Brunhilde, of course, is in charge of bringing the wounded and the dead to Valhalla. So Wotan summons Brunhilde and explains to her what he wants to have happen. And Brunhilde fights him on this and says, you have struggled for a generation to bring forth uh, this Siegmund, and now you want me to allow him to be killed by a common dog. Wotan says, don't think about it. Just do what I tell you. So Brunhilde goes to Siegmund and explains to him that he must die. And he says, is that absolutely certain? And she says, you would not be seeing me if it weren't. <laughs> because Brunhilde, or whichever Valkyrie, is always the last being that a warrior sees uh, before they, they go to Valhalla. So she uh, explains to him the reasons. This scene, 
it's revealed that not only uh, have Sigmund and Sieglinde made love, but in fact that Sieglinde is pregnant. So uh, Sigmund goes into battle confident that he will win, even though Brunhilde has assured him that he will not. And at the last moment, she relents, and her compassion for Sigmund and Sieglinde and their un as yet unborn child um, is so great that she steps in between them and uh, is about to strike the death blow to Hunding when Wotan himself intervenes and uh, shatters Notung, this amazing sword, with his own spear. Of course, the spear of Wotan is even more powerful than a, a sword that can be wielded by a mortal. And once he's taken care of Siegmund, he flips his hand at Hunding, who dies instantly and does not get to go to Valhalla, and then sets off in hot pursuit of Brunhilde, because she has really gone against his wishes and he's mad. So he's uh, chasing Brunhilde across the world, and uh, at this point we get the sisters. <laughs> sing-along, right? <laughs> well, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll do that. Uh, so the sisters uh, have all been gathering heroes who have died in the battle, from the battlefield, and uh, suddenly they realize that Brunhilde is coming up at top speed and that close behind her is their father, and he's very unhappy. So uh, as they are um, singing, and you know what Valkyries sing when they're alone together, we, we should do all of this, I think, but that would take more than an hour and 15 minutes. So, the sisters are all terrified because when Wotan gets into a rage, it's not just uh, you know, an ordinary parent-child squabble. It's um, suddenly volcanoes erupt and there's a huge thunderstorm approaching from the west. Brunhilde is saying, please shield me. And her sisters say, are you kidding? <laughs> there's no way. However, they are willing to take Sieglinde and carry Sieglinde to safety. There's one place that Wotan doesn't really like to go, and that is the cave where Fafner, who through the magic of the Tarnhelm has turned himself into a gigantic dragon, guard the gold. And, and the, the, the Tarnhelm and the ring, the whole treasure is there in this cave. So somewhere near that cave to the east, the, the, the Valkyries take um, Sieglinde, and she is held safe there, while Brunhilde has to deal with Wotan's wrath. At first, he says, I'm going to just throw you on the ground like a common mortal. And the first mortal male that comes along and decides to have you uh, can take you, and you'll be, you'll be his for life. You'll just be chattel. And uh, she says, you know, this is not really fair, because while I did disobey you completely, I actually knew what your will was. I did what you and your heart wanted. And what am I, what is Brunhilde, if not the will of Wotan? Smart girl, right? <laughs> so he relents somewhat. He says, all right, I'll still leave you on the ground asleep for eternity until someone comes to find you. However, I will put you in a ring of magic fire so that only the greatest of heroes will have the courage to break through that circle and claim you as their own. And not having a lot of choice, Brunhilde thanks him and uh, is, is put to sleep in this magic circle of fire. 
at, at which time Wagner brings together three of the light motifs of the ring. So this is uh, her enchanted sleep. And then we have the music of the fire itself. So die Valkyrie ends like this. Brunhilde is left sleeping in that magic circle of fire, and another generation passes. There's a lot of time between these operas. In this new generation, the baby that Sieglinde was carrying has grown to a, a very extraordinary teenage boy named Siegfried. Siegfried of course, was born near the dragon's lair, because that's where Brunhilde had told her sisters to take him, to take Sieglinde and him. And uh, he's grown up there, fostered by Alberic's brother, Mima. He had a very interesting dowry with him. There was a bag with shards of a sword in it. Now, Mima, you may remember, made the Tarnhelm and made the ring, and is quite gifted as a smithy. But there is nothing Mima can do to forge these pieces of steel together and create a sword. Because every time he does, Siegfried is able to smash it in seconds. So Mima, who knows the whole story, is going to watch and see and hope that if Siegfried is able to be heroic enough to win that ring back that Mima will be right on hand to take it for himself, which is pretty much what everybody in this opera is thinking about. How can they be the one to own the ring and dominate the world? Mima leaves Siegfried alone, and uh, in comes Wotan. Now, Wotan and Mima have a long conversation, which really serves in the opera, if you haven't seen the first two, to bring you up to date on the story. <laughs> so if you've seen Das Rheingold, and if you've seen Die Valkyrie, and you remember everything, the next five minutes will just sort of refresh your mind. That the giants had the ring, and then one giant killed his brother, the other giant, and that the gods had Valhalla uh, built for them by the giants. So once all of this is completed, Wotan goes on his way and uh, realizes that the time has come for Siegfried himself to try and forge that sword. So Wotan's parting words to uh, Mima are that it's only the person who knows no fear who can forge this 
store. Well, that description would certainly qualify uh, for Siegfried. Siegfried, whom we meet at the beginning of the opera with a, a bear on a rope. He's, he's completely at home in nature and at home with himself, and he doesn't have anything that frightens him in the least bit. So Mima gives over and allows Siegfried, who's had no experience with it, to melt down the sword completely, and uh, Siegfried hammers Notung into a new sword, which is apparently indestructible. So off goes Siegfried to the cave of the giant Fafnir. <laughs> asked, what is Fafner's vulnerability? And Mima has told him, this dragon is invincible. His scales are as hard as iron. His tail, if it touches you, will kill you immediately. The flames and the drips that come out of his nose are poison. If you're touched by a single drop, Siegfried says, oh, I guess that means I should be careful. <laughs> and Mima says, don't you know what fear is? And Siegfried, who is naturally curious, says, no, describe it to me. And Mima says, when you're in the woods and there's a sudden noise in the dark and you see a glimmering of light when you don't know what it is and your heart begins to quiver, that's called fear. And Siegfried says, wow, that sounds really great, but I've never felt that. So he goes off to see what he can do with the dragon. And literally, in the, a few bars of music, which in Wagner's time scale is extraordinarily short, he stabs the dragon right in the center of his heart with the sword, and the dragon falls dead. Well, the dragon sings for another two minutes, and then falls dead. And, and while the dragon is singing, he explains a little bit about the history of the world to uh, Siegfried. And then, Siegfried gets some of the dragon's blood on his finger and sticks it in his mouth and is immediately able to understand the language of the wood bird. The wood bird explains uh, what Siegfried needs to do next and says, in a circle of fire is a beautiful mate, perfect for you. Well, Siegfried goes off, follows the bird, and almost has uh, reached the place where the mate would be when he runs into a man uh, with one eye. And who should that be but Wotan, whom he has never met? Wotan is not willing to tell Siegfried his identity, but it is clear that if Wotan loved Siegmund or if Wotan loved Brunhilde, he loves this Siegfried even more. He is living proof that even among immortals, grandchildren are really cool. <laughs> so he, he gets into a long conversation with uh, Siegfried, and Siegfried just dismisses him. He says, I'm going to take your other eye out if you don't get out of my way. Finally, uh, Siegfried goes on, and uh, Wotan opposes him and puts his staff, Wotan's staff, the symbol of all of his power, all of his cunning, and all of his manipulative dealings, both with gods and humans. Of course, that would be a scale, not an arpeggio. <laughs> that's, that's Wotan's staff. Siegfried takes that sword and he shatters Wotan's staff. This has never happened. Siegfried then, oblivious, of the fact that he's just changed the course of world history, goes to find the prize that has been promised to him. And sure enough, there's a ring of fire. He sees first a horse waiting patiently. It's been waiting there for its rider for, you know, 18 years or so. That's Grana, that's Brunhilde's horse. And then he sees a soldier on the ground uh, with the breastplate and the helmet. So he carefully uses the sword to cut those off and says the famous opera words, das ist kein Mann. <laughs> that is not a man. So he, he has in fact discovered Brunhilde lying there. And uh, the two of them 
kind of a long, rapturous love duet. Uh, one part of it I bet you recognize from something else. <laughs> You've heard the orchestral piece, the Siegfried Idyll. Uh, that's the main theme, which Wagner uh, wrote for his wife, Cosima, and apparently on Christmas, their first Christmas together, she came downstairs and he had a whole orchestra in their living room playing this piece for her. So um, the end of Siegfried is the triumphant love of Brunhilde, who has now sacrificed her divinity uh, with Siegfried, who, though human, is the most heroic of, of all, of all humans. So the final opera, Goethe Dämmerung, The Twilight of the Gods, begins with three Norns. Now the Norns weave all of the strands of history together, but as Wotan points out at one time in the opera, they are not able to change, they are only able to know so the Norns can't alter the fabric of history, but they weave it together. And they serve, if you haven't seen the first three operas, to bring you up to date on what's going to happen before you see Goethe Demeron. But you know all that already, so we don't need to go through that. Now, that's a prelude to the five hours of music of the Goethe Demeron. Act one of the Goethe Demeron begins uh, back down on Earth, with a family, the Gibichungs, and the Gibichungs are as follows. There's a brother and sister, Gutrun and Gutrune, and Gutrun's half-brother, Hagen. Now, Hagen is the spawn of Albrecht. Even though Albrecht has renounced love, he, he didn't have to renounce sex as long as there was no love. And he has this child, Hagen, who is as evil as a human being could be. So Gudrun and Gudruna are both thinking it's time for them to get married. And who should stride into the Gibichung palace but Siegfried? Well, they give him a potion and they just say, welcome, we would like to toast your arrival. We've heard all about you. We know you're a great hero. And Siegfried, who is as guileless as he is heroic and powerful, drinks this potion down. The potion causes him to forget everything. He forgets Brunhilde, he forgets his love for her, and as they swear brotherhood in the Gibichun family, uh, Gudrune decides that Siegfried would be a good husband for her, and they decide that Brunhilde would be a good wife for uh, Gunther. I've been saying Gudrun, I mean Gunther. Um, so Gunther doesn't have the power or the courage to go through the magic fire circle. Therefore, Siegfried puts on the Tarn helm and assumes the human form of Gudrun. Uh, Gunther, whom I keep calling Gunther. He assumes the human form of Gunther and he goes through the circle, takes Brunhilde by force, and brings her back to the Gibichu. So suddenly we have the very happily and perfectly united couple, uh, Brunhilde and Siegfried, both being married off to other people, the brother and sister Gunther and uh, Gutrune, and Hagen uh, presiding over all of this. Now, at a certain point, Brunhilde realizes that she has been tricked, but she does not realize that Siegfried was given this potion and that he has no memory of her whatsoever. So in a jealous rage, she tells Gunther and Hagen his secret. When he was born, his mother had the option to protect his body with magic spells so that he could never be harmed. But because she knew, being the hero he was, that he would never turn away from a battle, she didn't bother to put the magic on his back. She only put it on his front. So Gutrun and Gutruna and Gunther and Hagen are able to murder Siegfried, stabbing him in the back. Uh, so this is what happens. And um, at last, 
the magic of, of the ring is coming toward its home. Siegfried has a funeral march. I'm going to play a little of it for you because I bet you recognize this. same chords with which the uh, opera Goethe Demerung opens. Now, Brunhilde realizes that there is no further life for her with Siegfried gone. So she jumps on Grana, her horse, and uh, they have lit an enormous funeral pyre in which Siegfried's body is going to be burned. And Brunhilde rides her horse Grana right into this so that she, too, is burned in the same flames that consume Siegfried. And she takes the ring and throws it into the Rhine, returning not just the gold, but all of the power that the ring confers to the Rhine maidens and to the world where it belongs. I say these things in, in operatic time um, when Brunhilde rides into the fire, she sings a 17-minute aria, uh, the so-called immolation scene, which incorporates many of the light motifs that you've learned and heard over the last 15 hours, if you go to all the movies. And um, the extraordinary thing is that <laughs> Brunhilde, uh, who is die Valkyrie, is able to restore all of the order of the universe, uh, symbolically, without having to rewind the clock. This new uh, race of human champions is born. It, it's, it's been created and it can't be stopped. But uh, Brunhilde is still able to go back to the Rhine with that ring. It would be impertinent of me to say that I know what Wagner's meaning is in just about anything. However, I think it's fair to say that uh, there's a certain amount of autobiography in anything that anybody creates. And uh, Wagner felt very strongly that he was a new race of composer, a new race of dramatist, that he was giving to the world a whole new type of drama, a whole new way of looking at drama. And uh, when we have this original race of gods uh, that are powerful, but rigid and contained in their thoughts um, that needs to be broken open. A new world needs to be unleashed on. And so, in addition to all the other symbolic levels at which the ring cycle can be interpreted, there's also Wagner saying, it is time for something new, time for something completely different, time for Richard Wagner. Um, <laughs> There's a moment in the duet between uh, Fricka and uh, Wotan when she says, have you ever heard of a brother and sister treating one another as bride? And he said, Wotan says, no, isn't that wonderful? It's completely new. It's never happened before. <laughs> now, Fricka, I mean, yeah, Fricka shuts him down on that. But it is very much a Wagner thought that something which is completely new, however foreign, however rejected by everybody else, might be the doorway to something new and extraordinary. The end of Goethe Demerol brings us back to Wagner's theme that's so dear to his heart of redemption, redemption through love. Brunhilde saves the world by sacrificing herself, riding into that fire, and uh, the themes uh, begin to come together at the end of Goethe Demerol, like this. So the redemption through love thing. <laughs> remember that. <laughs> uh, these are Ryan. 
Valhalla motif, which comes from divinity in a human key with scales going on underneath it. So piecing together all of what we've said, it's Wagner saying, when the gods at their twilight are no more, there is something to take their place that is both divine and human, and therefore would be able to take the motif of Valhalla. Bim, bom, 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 bom combined with bum 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 and be in C major, a human key, not D flat.